and welcome to another video about screen printing by Cat's Pit Productions. So today's video is the answers video to last week's or week or so ago vlog video about you know questions and answers and a whole lot of this that and the other thing. So today I'm going to try to answer your questions to the best of my ability. All right so the first question I'm going to answer was actually kind of asked by two different people and I actually do plan on doing a video about this in the future. So uh, let's see, it was uh, my I reading, you know? Uh, Horatio Rodriguez and Sean Brown. So you guys were asking about, you know, what's the best way to cure water-based inks, you know, with a flash cure? And, um, you know, with dealing with plastisol or with when dealing with water-based inks, how might I go about properly curing these with just an infrared flash, meaning, you know, a standard infrared flash. All right, so Sean Brown and Horatio Rodriguez were asking, how can you cure water-based inks with a standard infrared flash cure? And it's basically, you know, one of two ways, really. You can either print the shirts and set them out flat around your studio or your shop, let them lie out flat to dry by evaporation, and then heat set, set them with the flash cure. Or you can just, you know, use more time. Like each shirt would have to be flashed for a longer amount of time, you know, individually to allow the solvents to evaporate from the, from the ink and then for the pigments to heat set. For water-based inks. But remember that, you know, water-based inks dry in the screen while you work, right? So probably if all you have is an infrared flash, you're probably going to want to, you know, you have to work fast. So you're going to probably want to print them and set them out on some tables or wherever you can and let them dry by evaporation, then clean up your screen or your screens or what have you, and then go back when they're dry to the touch by evaporation and individually flash cure them with the infrared flash and heat set the pigments in the water-based tank. That would probably be the best scenario to do it since water-based tanks dry while you work. Uh, Bart Mikulski, one? No, Bart Mikulski. <laughs> I, won't, I won't try to pronounce it. Here's the question though wet on wet printing with plastisol inks how to avoid the pickup you know building up of ink on the subsequent screens and when should you print like that and when shouldn't you um so that's uh yeah okay so <laughs> all right so usually one of the only ways to reduce pickup is what we call it or build up of ink on subsequent you know, screens in a multicolor when you're printing wet on wet would be either to use a an ink that is specifically low tack or low pickup um, or to add reducer. Reducer actually has anti-tacking agents in it to help uh, reduce the pickup of ink when you're printing wet on wet. Okay, but it's not always possible, you know, some inks, I think, you know, when you inherently have more pigment in the ink, it's just a heavier ink, like high opacity inks are nearly impossible to print wet on wet. Okay, but that, and that goes in turn to say that, you know, when should you or when shouldn't you? Well, it's more like when can you and when can't you, you know, Printing on dark garments, you may or may not be able to, depending on the inks you're using and the final print look that you want, you know, the print surface and everything like that. Um, when you're on a white shirt or light colored shirts, you can often print wet on wet very easily because you're printing such a lower volume of ink anyway, you know. Um, so that can, you know, uh, CMYK on white shirts is, is always pretty much wet on wet. So you know really the print job itself is going to determine what you can do on press and sometimes even when you plan it out you know hey we're going to flash this or we're going to print this wet on wet when you finally get on press and start printing it sometimes you'll learn oh you know what it looks better if i do it this way and 
that's just the nature of the beast, no matter how well you plan something out. And, you know, maybe there are those of us out there that are such experts with artwork that we never have that problem. But uh, usually when you get on press, you're going to really see how the job is going to print. And uh, that's why I say artwork can make or break you on press. So uh, hopefully I kind of answered that for you. All right, so here's a really easy question to answer uh, from Mick Lendon Winbush. What's the best ink and squeegee to use for screen printing? And, you know, that's obviously the best squeegees and the best inks are on catsbitscreenprintsupply.com. No, but seriously, yes, I, I use the same stuff that I sell. Okay, seriously speaking, um, I sell the stuff that I use. So I use this ink. All tax that I'm selling here, the stuff on my e-commerce site, that's the ink we're using in all the current videos. All right, so really quick, again, uh, Sean Brown asked, uh, you know, for tips on achieving a soft hand or vintage looking print with Plastisol inks. And, uh, you know, I actually did a video about this. Okay, so basically, you can use high opacity inks and print them directly on dark garments without an underbase and print a lower volume of ink and you'll get that kind of faded, vintage, muted, colored look, okay? Um, there are also other ways to go about it. What I'll do is I will put the link for the video uh, that I made about how to make Plastisol screen prints feel softer. I'll put that link for that video in the video description below because I think my best tips for what you're asking are in that video basically. You know, it's going to be a combination of artwork and the volume of ink printed. So check out that video for a further, you know, more detailed uh, explanation. Okay, so here is a rather complex question from Alice D025. Uh, keep the hair. Keep the hair. All right. Votes in. All right, so um, the question is, can you print water-based inks over Plastisol and vice versa? All right, so, yeah, okay, so how do I go about answering this? Okay, you know, um, I am sure it has been done in various ways. And I know that you can print, you know, Plastisol inks over like a discharge base. Um, but you wanna make sure, of course, that the discharge uh, activator or the discharge action is completely done. And you might wanna do some testing to make sure that there's no residual uh, after effects on the plastisol when you print a plastisol on top of a discharge base, you know, just a discharge base without any pigment. Uh, you know, I've seen that done plenty of times. I've even, uh, you know, uh, seen and heard of people accidentally mixing water-based and plastisol together and still printing with it. And uh, I do know that, you know, these PlastiCharge uh, type products where it's a plastisol discharge ink, some of those are actually, you know, water-based discharge uh, kind of a base product that you add a little bit of plastisol ink to. So, um, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, you can in certain situations, in certain situations, you may be able to work with both inks at the same time. Uh, just keep in mind that some water-based inks, you know, really need to be printed onto the cotton fabric or the, you know, the fabric in order to bond well. So anytime you're experimenting with that, I would recommend that you do testing. But you certainly could print, you know, water-based inks next to Plastisol inks for effect. Like, for instance, you could print a water-based ink design and then use Plastisol for one element of that design to make it pop or look different. You follow? So in that respect, you certainly can. So the answer to your question is, well, yeah, you probably can in different ways, and I'm sure it's been done, but technically speaking, we tend to work with one ink or the other. You know, if we're working with water base, we work with water base. If we're working with Plastisol, we work with Plastisol. We don't necessarily mix them unless there's some kind of creative reason or some kind of technical reason or something that you would, would want to make you do that. Otherwise, you know, 
we wouldn't necessarily do that except for the minor exceptions that I mentioned perhaps. All right, so here is a multi-part question by Liquid Nebula, Liquid Nebula. Um, okay, so um, yeah, let the hair grow, that's cool. 74 Chevy Nova, always a thumbs up for the Novas. My brother had a 1970 SS, or was it a fake? Ooh. Um, okay, so if I could do a do-it-yourself screen printing kit, what would I include that others don't? Um, well, I actually have, you know, kits and packages on my e-commerce site, and I think one of the things that I noticed in a lot of the lesser packages is um, they include a, uh, a spreader for putting the emulsion on the screen, and I, I always have a scoop coater, okay? So um, when you look at the cat spit kits on my e-commerce site, they're all going to have scoop coaters, no spreaders, okay? Uh, and I also include a little bit wider variety of accoutrements like pallets and things like that. Uh, pocket pallet, sleeve pallet, and uh, a couple different pallets that, that enable you to print more locations on your garments. Okay. Um, which is my absolute favorite ink? And again, that goes back to the same thing. I use the products that I sell on my e-commerce site. So currently, you know, my favorite ink is the Altex ink that I sell on catsbitscreenprintsupply.com. Uh, it's really good plastisol ink and, you know, excellent pricing, so you should try it out. All right. Um, what design has been the most enjoyable to work with and what design has been the least enjoyable, you know, most difficult project? Well, I think my most difficult project was many years ago when I was running some automatic presses for a company in Tucson. Arizona and uh, they were doing a four color process print on a white underbase you know on a black shirt and it was it was King Kong you know it was a really cool King Kong print and uh, it was kind of you know it was kind of difficult to do because of the white underbase and the fact that the you know the color separations weren't the greatest so we kind of had to tweak the color by managing you know how much pressure you have on each uh, print head for each of the colors and stuff. So it was always a problematic job to print and I always got stuff printing it because I seemed to be the only guy who could get it halfway decent and uh, <laughs> you know so uh, that was yeah that was it was the King Kong four color process on white underbase a black shirt that was yeah and the most enjoyable um, you know, I, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, probably the Cat Spit Productions Secret Society logo, the triangle logo, um, the one that's on the screen that you probably can't see. Uh, but the reason for that is, is because that that triangle logo with the swirls and the skull and bones in the middle, it's a very simple one color print, but it's unique and it draws attention to its it, the print. You know, people look at it and they're kind of like, what is that? You know what I'm saying? So for a one color print, it's very effective and very cool. And it, it you know, kind of inspires people to ask, what's Cat's Bit? Okay, so here's another question from uh, Sean Brown. And this is a rather complex, uh, multifaceted question here. Um, squeegee pressure and angle on a pull stroke. You know, when to apply more or less pressure and when to choose to alter your stroke angle on a pull stroke. Also, how does more squeegee pressure versus less pressure affect the end result of your print? And what about, you know, fibrillation as a byproduct? So, you know, as you know, um, I print a lot with the push print stroke. So I pull flood and I push stroke. So in that case, the angle has a lot to, a lot to do with many things. Um, when, you're, when you're pulling the squeegee, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's going to be a combination of pressure and squeegee angle. So 
when when the ink isn't clearing out of the mesh, when you do your print stroke and pull the screen up and there's still ink in the mesh and, and not all of the ink is on the shirt and you can still see shirt through the print, right? Then you most likely need to increase your, your pressure on your print stroke, okay? Um, the angle, you know, depending on, you know, the angle can affect, you know, it's a little bit different on a pull print. The angle, you know, may not affect it as much. Obviously, if it's straight up and you pull it across, it's probably going to scrape more ink off than at a more severe angle where it's going to be tending to push it, pushing the ink down, you know. So probably, you know, probably you're going to, you know, if it's not printing, you're going to increase your pressure and maybe slightly, you know, make the angle more severe, okay? Um, let's look at that question again. So how does, how does the pressure affect the print, print and, and such? Well, less pressure is going to lay down, you know, uh, okay, here, this is complicated, okay, so... So depending on what's going on, if you don't use enough pressure, the ink isn't going to come out of the mesh, and it's just not going to print. But on the other hand, there are certain scenarios which I teach in my class where when you use a little bit less pressure, but you make sure the ink shears, it's going to lay down more ink. This is a very complex thing, and that's why, uh, that's why I do recommend the pull flood push stroke, because it... it it's a lot easier to explain and it's a lot easier to control um, you know uh, so so yeah the you know the if you use too much pressure in your print stroke any print stroke you're gonna possibly flood out the details and blur out the edges right so too much pressure can flood things out smush out the edges cause the ink to bleed, fill in all the little letters, like if you have little E's and I's and P's and stuff with the A's and, you know, little holes and tiny letters, it'll fill all that in. While too little pressure, you know, in some cases may not print enough ink, or in other cases it might print too much ink, okay? Um, maybe I have to do a video about the, the one-hit wonder print again a more modern version of it and try to explain it a little bit more um, in detail if I can however it is the secret thing that I teach in my personal one-on-one -on -one training so I don't know if I want to you know give away too much for free on YouTube then nobody will take my classes <laughs> okay so um, anyway did we get to all let's see so more or less pressure alter your angle Again, the angle I would only alter as far as comfort has to be comfortable for you, the printer, and it also has to be printing properly. Obviously, you know, if the print doesn't look good when you're doing it one way or the other, then, you know, adjust what you're doing, you know. Um, fibrillation, you know what? I did a video, and maybe you should look at, maybe you want to look at this video, and I'll put it in the video description for you, the link, but I did a video about how to uh, increase uh, print, print resolution and clarity, and I also did a video about fibrillation, so I'll put those two links in there, and you may have seen them, but those videos do explain a lot about what would cause fibrillation and uh, how to increase your print clarity and that goes for you know leads us into the last question that I have for this video which has probably already turned out to be too long the last question that we have from Rebecca Lamb is I have to wipe the screen to stop excess ink transfer after every single print drives me mad how do I stop this I'm printing on paper carrier bags all right so you know I'm more of a textile guy I do know a bit about graphic stuff, but I'm not sure exactly what you're printing, but if it's a graphic industrial application and you're having a problem with excessive ink, you might want to try to increase your mesh count to reduce the ink flow and or use a harder squeegee. Harder squeegees will print less ink with more detail. So those two things might help you out. And I also did a video about increasing print res resolution and clarity, as I mentioned previously, um, that might have some tips in it that will help you out. So check out the video description for that. 
but the bottom line is whenever you're printing something, uh, if you're using a very thin graphic ink, um, you're going to want to be careful about the flood. You know, don't over flood the screen. And if it's an air dry ink, you got to be really careful about the back flood that it's not, you know, coming into the mesh. So it may be very important for you to move up to a higher mesh count and just use a harder squeegee. And of course, make sure your substrate isn't moving around on you at all. That's probably the best general tips I could give you. And then, you know, maybe watch the video on how to increase print resolution and clarity. All right, so um, I hope that you guys enjoyed this. I hope this was cool. I hope everybody, uh, I got all the questions in and I made sense. I tried to answer them in the best detail I could. And uh, we'll do this again in the future, of course. That's all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed the answers and questions vlog and video. And uh, if you like my video work, of course, please remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel, you know, because it keeps me motivated to keep producing these videos for you right here on YouTube for free. So make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel today, right now. And if you need screen printing equipment or supplies, check out catspitscreenprintsupply.com. All right. I've got to get in the back and start testing some water-based inks that I'm hoping to offer to you in the near future. All right, so that's all we have for today. We'll see you guys next time, and I'm going to get to work.